Thank you all, and welcome to Enabling Open Tofu for the Enterprise. I'm Douglas Flagg, a Principal Cloud Engineer at Fidelity Investments, and I have the pleasure of speaking to you today here with Jordan Nagata, a Senior Engineer at Fidelity Investments. Now, both of us work on the Cloud IAC platform team at Fidelity. We both work on the, uh, our team's purpose is to help development teams at Fidelity use the best infrastructure as code or IAC tools um, to enable their adoption of those, those great tools. To enable this, we pave the path by setting up the core and common IAC tools that we think will get teams easily bootstrapped into using IAC. We also evaluate promising new IAC tools uh, when considering them for adoption into those paved path solutions. We are a single and small team, so we need to make sure that this works across the various organizations that make up our enterprise, where many teams have different restrictions and cultures on how they use IAC. Okay. Uh, and I'll just note that we talk about both Terraform and Tofu in this, but to be more general, we'll, we'll just use TF, because Fidelity uses both Terraform and Tofu, so we'll be a little vague. We'll start by providing some stats uh, to give you a feeling of our TF usage at Fidelity. And these numbers are pulled from our HTTP state backend. Next, we'll build piece by piece the roadmap of our IAC platform we want to build that'll enable the enterprise to use infrastructure as code. And this map will outline those concrete steps and considerations an enterprise might have uh, to enable their IAC platform. Then we'll circle back and review what we learned through building the IAC platform, including the things we wish we had done differently and those we, we think we did well. And finally, we'll talk about how we enabled open tofu for our existing Terraform users. So here's a brief uh, slide on how we, our usage of TF at Fidelity, and this is as of October. Um, we have thousands of applications, tens of thousands of environments, and workspaces, and millions of resources managed by our, our state backend. And resources here simply refers to TF resources. So any of your TF uh, resource files, this is what we have stored in state files in this backend. Workspaces are basically just those individual state files, um, and environments are how we separate and organize those in that backend. So this right here, don't be too afraid. I don't know if we can see it that well, but this is what the IAC platform looks like today. It didn't start out this way, um, and it wasn't a straightforward journey getting here, but don't worry too much about the details right now as we're gonna show you step-by-step step how to build this. And I'm gonna turn that over to Jordan. He's gonna show you how to build your platform. All right, thanks, Doug. So what we're going to cover on the roadmap is roughly the order we think an IAC platform team should consider enabling TF usage. Um, this doesn't exactly track the order that we enabled it. This is just the refined order that we kind of took away from doing this. Um, and we will note areas you might want to consider changing focus if you have different priorities than the ones that we had when we were setting up. Um, and like Doug said, I'm going to be interchanging Terraform and Tofu. I know this is a primarily Tofu crowd. I know all of you got your little plushies, so you know, please don't throw them at me as we talk about Terraform. Um, so four years ago, we didn't have a platform that supported the needs of engineers that wanted to use Terraform. Our platform looked a lot like this. It was a bunch of empty boxes that we knew we needed to create, uh, but we didn't actually have anything there. Um, and so this would become eventually the platform that would allow developers to adopt open tofu. And so we knew we needed to create it, but we didn't know exactly where to start. Uh, and we came up with the idea of core services. And for context, we had all these engineers at Fidelity. They were trying to use Terraform, but they didn't have the tools they needed. But we did set up tools before. This wasn't our first time enabling an IAC tool. Um, for other tools, governing IAC usage was actually pretty critical. And so that's where we decided to start. And so we created our first application, which is called the IAC Linting API. Now, this is an API that is completely owned by Doug and I uh, in our team. Uh, it's a security API that governs IAC usage, primarily by linting TF plans, and ensure that they comply with Fidelity security and compliance rules. It, to sum it up, it reports uh, when errors and violations are found in the plans. And 
Once we had this API spun up, we actually got a lot of insight of how people were using Terraform at the time. Uh, we could see that many teams were using Terraform, they were using our linting API, they are doing it safely and securely, but one of the issues is that they didn't have a common place to store their own TF state. Uh, they were creating their own S3 buckets, they were creating their own storage accounts, uh, and it was kind of all over the place. It was a little bit of the Wild West. And so we knew exactly which core service we wanted to add next. We wanted to add a TF HTTP state backend, uh, a backend that securely stores TF state files as an implementation of the remote HTTP state backend. Uh, this is compatible with both the Terraform CLI and the OpenTofu CLI uh, using that remote spec. Um, but we quickly ran into our next problem. Uh, we needed a way to scale onboarding. We had all these people that were excited. We have a centralized area that they can just throw their state into, uh, but we have to scale onboarding and RBAC configuration for all of the different, uh, all the different workspaces that were getting spun up. And so we, we created our next core service, which was the TF HTTP state onboarding API. Now this is an API that enables self-service onboarding uh, through the API to onboard onto our HTTP, HTTP state backend. Um, so users can create separate environments for application states, but they can also configure any RBAC that matches their use case. At Fidelity, we have a lot of teams with a lot of different ways they want to configure RBAC, so we let them handle it. Uh, and because an API isn't always the cleanest way to do things, we did create a UI for this. It was just uh, another easier method to onboard to the backend uh, with validation and error handling. And you'll notice a common theme for all of our UI is that it is hosted on our developer portal through Backstage. Okay, so now we have our core services, but what about calling Fidelity specific APIs? Uh, we had teams that, who had started using Terraform, but many resources for internal services could not be managed directly through TF resources. Uh, through inner source contributions, just general enthusiasm for using Terraform at the time, uh, providers were actually created over all of our internal CRUD APIs. Uh, now, I do want to note, not every API within your enterprise is going to need a TF provider. Uh, these were created because there was no pre-existing open source provider out there, and they were for specifically internal APIs that exposed full CRUD capabilities. If One way to think about this is that if you have a pipeline that is calling an internal API directly, and that API manages resources, you probably are gonna to wanna to put a provider on it. Now, the IAC platform team, which is the team that Doug and I are on, is responsible for essentially maintaining TF providers through, um, that have been developed through all the different teams and organizations within Fidelity. Uh, we act as maintainers, we act as, uh, toward like an inner source model, we take in bug reports and feature requests, and sometimes we do them ourselves, and other times we get the teams to do it for us. Um, but just wanted to note that we do maintain that. And so now that we had a few internal providers, we actually needed a place to put all of these providers, which comes to our next component. Uh, we wanted to have some kind of centralized TF registry. This wasn't something that we had, and for a long time, teams had a hard time finding, okay, where do I get my providers, how do I install them, and how do I actually use them in my project? Um, and so Having a private provider registry makes it convenient for users to discover and download providers. I, the only downside was that users needed to configure auth to the registry before their deployments to have access to all of our custom and internal providers. Um, and all of this is great, but you know, how do I do this through my pipeline? And that's, uh, and it's not really just the registry. Uh, we have all these great services. I talked about our core services, right? Um, but how do I use them for my pipeline? Now, Fidelity has this concept of the Fidelity Pipeline Library. And that's just a fancy word of saying it's a shared library of different pipeline functions that anybody in the company is able to contribute to, but also use. Uh, and so we knew that we wanted to add to this, uh, to this library, and we started under two main categories. Um, one was under registry enablement. Uh, so the registry enablement function that we provided you know, it w it allows them to configure auth uh, to the registry uh, during their deployments. The other one that we kind of focused on was all the TF functions. So all the functions that you know and love from the Tofu CLI, things like init, plan, apply, destroy, and so much more. We added functions for those too, but we actually added a little bit more. Uh, we added all of the tricky configuration that they might need to interact with our core services. So now teams can just use these functions without really the overhead of setting up anything with our core services. Um, and all of these can be wrapped up into a nice little package. So we also have a concept of segments. And segments are a higher level pre-made pipeline package that come together using all the pipeline functions. 
And so users can configure this prepackaged pipeline through YAML configuration. And so we authored a segment for just common TF deployments. Now, I will say this doesn't cover everybody, but it does cover a large percentage of users, uh, which is really nice. And if they have more custom uh, pipelines that they need, we always have the library there for them to use. And so at this point, we really have everything enabled for development teams. Um, but the next problem you're going to run into is, where do I go when things break or they don't go my way? Um, and so pretty early on, we created the idea of the TF support channel. Now, this evolved multiple times, but now it's an official channel. It's an open chat channel for where users can ask questions to get help with issues relating to all services and components that you've seen so far. Um, now, we are a small team. There always hasn't, there hasn't really been many of us over the years, um, but the team monitors that channel and answers any questions that come in. And one thing that we didn't expect is by having that open channel, we kind of created a community over time where people feel like, okay, I have the knowledge set, I can actually go in and answer this question uh, for anybody who may come and ask. The other thing that we realized was super helpful is just having centralized docs for the platform. Now, we at first we found that it was just nice and easy for us to take common questions and publish an FAQ. That way users can help themselves on some of our most common uh, questions. However, this eventually evolved over time as we started adding more and more things to our platform. Uh, we ended up adding docs into one single place. Uh, and this was for users to reference how to use all of our services. It sounds like a no-brainer, but when you're in the weeds, it's one of the things that you actually t tend to overlook. And so I do want to change uh, context a little bit and talk about the emergence of all of our Terraform and OpenTofu uh, compatible modules. Now, we didn't need to build and maintain many modules for the enterprise. They just kind of showed up. Uh, speaking on our own team, the platform team, so these are platform developed modules that we currently own. Um, these are modules that were developed by our team to solve common issues when creating our core services. So when we were creating our own applications, what did we need to reuse? What did we need a module for? Um, now, that applies to us, but it also applies to other teams. As they were creating their own modules uh, for their own applications, we actually started seeing a glimpse of the, co the culture that was soon to come. And th there was a lot of module sharing across many different teams and contributing to them, uh, but it was all word of mouth. And there was no official platform to support this culture around our inner source developed modules. And the problem that we had with this was that we would often see duplication of these modules. There was no official place to share modules and contribute to them. And so that's when we realized that we needed something more. Uh, we needed a module catalog, but we also needed a module maturity standard. And so with many modules emerging, we wanted a single pane of glass to search uh, and discover modules. We wanted to provide a framework for modules where consumers would be able to compare and contrast the quality and the feature set of various modules. And so this started with the module catalog, which is a catalog that our team owns, but you can think of it as we own the catalog, but we do not own everything that comes onto the catalog. Uh, this uh, is a way for individuals to discover details and links on various Terraform and Tofu modules across the enterprise. Now there's filters for CSPs, providers, common resources, uh, used to assist users and discover the module that meets their needs. Um, and it's worth noting that uh, the catalog is inner source, so any team that sees a module on that catalog, they are free to contribute to it. Um, now modules, like I said, they're maintained by the organization that implements them. They're not maintained by our team. We just strictly manage the catalog that they exist on. Um, which is a very different than the way that we handle providers. Uh, and one of the things to come out of the module catalog was the idea of the patterns catalog. Um, this emerged because uh, patterns were starting to be created out of collection of our modules. So, and so things like uh, static websites, API gateways, uh, RAG implementations, all these were built on top of modules. And so this, we needed a way that was just, okay, if you want this, here's an easy way to come and deploy it. Um, but because we had all these modules, there was no way to determine if they were trustworthy. And when I say trustworthy, I mean, do they pass all of our security rules? Are they compliant? Now, we have guardrails within Fidelity that are going to block you from ever deploying if you don't reach that compliance. But at that point, you've already added it to your Terraform or Tofu config. So it, now you've just wasted some time, right? And so uh, we needed a, a way to allow people to understand, okay, this module is ready to go and I can use it out of the box. Um, so we created the module maturity standard. Now these standards agree are standards that came from uh, representatives from various BUs across Fidelity. Um, and so when I say BUs, I mean 
teams and teams that fall under various organizations and departments within Fidelity. Uh, and so uh, these requirements kind of fall under different grading standards. So we had the idea of uh, a maturity standard that follows sandbox, incubating, and graduated. And each one of these grades contains requirements for things like documentation, things for testing, governance, support, versioning, uh, even the amount of contributors that that module has, um, and how many releases, which are meant to give our users a consistent way to view the catalog and kind of find the ones that they want to use. And if their use case doesn't exist yet, then they can start thinking, okay, I think I can contribute that. So we, once we had a lot of different teams starting to use our platform, we started getting a, a big demand for reporting services. Uh, and so we heard from many organizations that they want to know, okay, what resources is it, are, you know, are in my safe file? What provider versions are are my teams using? Um, and so we needed a way to enable that for them. Uh, so we created the TF State API, which is another API that our platform team owns. Now this is a API that only we contribute to. Uh, it's a self-service utility for creating custom reports for, from our TF State backend usage, including number of workspaces, resources present in the state file, and also the ability to filter by things like organization or application or even environment. Uh, and while this API was great and you can get all the custom reports, some people felt like they should just go to a dashboard and get all the information that they needed. And so we created the TF State UI, a web UI that lets users see pre-generated aggregate reports on pretty much everything that they have in their environments. And so that was a way to alleviate that pain of calling the API. Another one that we created was the TF Lock API. It's another self-service utility to give users visibility on existing locks of maybe failed or incomplete deployments. Um, this helps users identify orphan state locks so that states can be uh, unlocked. And uh, it's the same, same scenario here. Uh, we just found it that it was easier if we created some kind of dashboard that users could use under our state lock UI, also posted on Backstage. Uh, so we also found that if you need to prove adoption usage of your IAC platform for OpenTOFU, uh, you should probably build your reporting functionality sooner. Um, the other thing that comes with it is that teams will begin to want to adopt your platform once they find out you have reporting. Uh, we had several teams who for the longest time held out on us, and then the second they found out we have dashboards and reporting, they wanted to onboard right away. And so talking about promotional bits, um, learning resources were actually pretty big for us. Um, so internally, we have a, a video learning series called Cloud Bytes. Now, these Cloud Bytes can cover many, many different topics. However, we contributed to those Cloud Bytes uh, by demonstrating how to do uh, basics with Tofu, or in migrating to to from Tofu from another IAC tool, or even how to, to uh, test your Tofu config. We also created the TF Jam repo. Now this is an older repo that we did really early in our journey, uh, which was to spur the adoption of Terraform. We created a, a repository with a bunch of different Terraform exercises that users could then use to demonstrate how to use Terraform, but also all of our self-service tools that we were beginning to build. Um, today, this repo has been updated to support OpenTOFU. And we also created a, a Tofu examples repo. Now, when we chose to enable Tofu, we came up with a separate repo uh, to demonstrate pretty much the lack or the, uh, the minor changes necessary to use Tofu. So how you can take your project that exists on Terraform and kind of just drop it in and start using Tofu. We did find that if you need to increase adoption earlier, um, you need to do more of this as soon as possible. This is really what brought in a lot of the people that use our platform. So this is our platform today, made up of all the components that we've covered. Um, this platform is the platform that enables all teams and developers for both Tofu and Terraform. Uh, and so now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Doug to cover all the lessons that we learned on this journey. Thanks for building us that map, Jordan. All right, let's review what we learned while building this ISC platform, what we really wanted to change maybe if we'd done it again, and then what we think we did well. Um, probably the first and biggest thing was we really wish we had a TF module and provider registry available earlier in the process. As until this year, we installed all of our providers manually. Um, this meant we had to do a lot of manual development in those pipelines to make that work with our automation. Constant source of friction uh, for teams and led to a lot of confusion that could have been avoided by having this earlier. Um, also having that module registry would have avoided having this culture of pointing to GitHub URLs for our modules which 
if it's not pointed to a release tag, it could change, and sometimes we've got users getting unexpected changes. And that's not something you ever want. Uh, having or curating our developer documentation with frequently asked questions really helped teams and engineers help themselves and avoided our most common questions. Um, so less traffic to the help channel. Also discovering modules without a registry UI, and this is something that Jordan was, was referring to earlier, uh, or something like the backstage catalog we have is really, uh, really helpful because without that, it's really just a process of hearsay. We don't know, or our users don't know where those modules are or where to find them reliably. Uh, enforcing the module maturity standard, which govern the prominence in the module catalog. So if a, a module is graduated, it's gonna show up earlier on than a module that's just sandbox. Um, by uh, applying those, we, we could be more certain that what those modules were worked well for those users. It also caused a lot of the module developers to develop things in a more standard way. Uh, we also built a buffet of appealing tools. We didn't require any organizations or teams to adopt them. Instead, we tried to create those great experiences for developers with our self-service tooling um, to solve their most common issues that we were hearing from them. And we let teams adopt them at their own pace. Now, just because we had great tools didn't mean people knew about them. Um, so we still needed to promote the availability of those tools. And a lot of that was done through those learning campaigns that Jordan was mentioning at the end there. Um, we showed how easy the tools were to use and adopt. Finally, what we're here to talk about today. Uh, how did we enable open tofu for all this? So obviously, when we started this journey, everything was in Terraform, or a lot of cases, cloud formation, uh, and eventually moved to Terraform. But now, how do we enable it for open tofu? And this is something that really we began to think about and discuss earlier this year. Um, so. What did we do to enable this for our enterprise? Where did we need to change? What didn't we need to change? Our internal providers, they worked fine. All of our modules, we didn't have any issues there. HTTP state backend, no problem. Terragrunt, they were all satisfied, any of our users that were using that. But what did we actually need to change? There were some slight changes to our uh, TFRC file for resolving the providers from the, the, the what is it, the Tofu registry very minor stuff. Most of the work was really involved in our core and common pipelines. We really just needed to add the TFCLI binary into those core and common pipeline build images, and then adding additional parameter to allow them to choose which CLI they want to use. Because right now they can choose Terraform or they can use choose Tofu. We've just added that as an option now. That was it. That was all that we needed to do to use Tofu. And so I really want to say thank you all for coming and learning about how we built an ISC platform for Open Tofu. But really, I want to give a special thanks to the Open Tofu maintainers and contributors for making. <laughs> yes, clap. Thank you so much for making it so easy to adopt Tofu. Questions? for folks to come up for questions. Uh, one of the most difficult things uh, in, in a or regulated organization is to deal with third party auditors. What were some of the areas in which that, uh, in which you had to evolve your platform to accommodate for um, um, document production and all that? Yeah, I think really having strict RBAC controls uh, implemented pretty early on around the state backend was super helpful and letting our users uh, set those quite tightly, I think, was, was something that was helpful. Hey, so I was wondering if you can give some examples of um, internal Terraform providers that you've built? Uh, yeah, so I actually meant to cover those while we were talking about it. Um, but one of the things where we, we have an API where we need to deploy roles and policies into, um, into different CSPs, right? Uh, all of that goes through a security check, which is automated through an API. That's one example of where before those can get deployed, 
those have to go through that API and actually get deployed through that. Um, so we have full CRUD commands around those. So that was an example of where a provider might need to go. Um, another one being if you have the, uh, if you need to make network associations between your CSP and your internal network, you might want to do a provider for that as well if that's managed by an API. Uh, another one being things like secret management. Um, we have an internal API at Fidelity, the way we handle secrets, so we needed uh, a provider for that as well. So if I may ask a follow-up, is HCL the primary way that application teams are interacting with your platform? Yeah. Okay. If you're asking if they're primarily using uh, like config, uh, yes, they're using OpenTofu config that's written you know, in .tf, right? Um, but are they primarily using HCL directly? Um, not? Yeah, sorry, I think we're out of time. We can talk to you yeah. after this, sorry. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.